Okay, it is 4.30. Today is our last lecture. I don't think yeah. you're amplified. Ah, okay, thank you for reminding me. I turned on that, that one, I didn't turn on this one. Hello, hello. You really want to sing when you get a mic, you know. But I'll sit with you that. Okay. Um, so today's our last lecture, and it's just going to be a summary of what we've covered so far. Uh, and it's going to be very quick, but uh, cover some of the main points that you'll need to, hopefully you will have learned during the semester, and just a, a brief reminder. But if you have questions, then you can bring up questions about any of the issues that we talk about. OK, so the first thing we talked about was implicature. And implicature is really pretty much the basis of what this whole course is about, because what I've been arguing since lecture one is that all meaning creation is basically so-called implicature. And what is that? Where did that come from? This idea, uh, it's the same thing as what I'm talking about in terms of uh, abductive inference. So it basically it was Rice who first came forward with the insight that language isn't just a coding decoding kind of thing that there's a lot of meaning creation involved and the reason why we can create meaning out of what people do it wasn't first of all let me skip to him uh, so what he argued was that um, you know it, it, he was stimulated by the fact that logic the way logic works and the way natural language works is quite different and we looked at a lot of examples of that and he so he was interested in meaning uh, natural versus what he called not natural meaning, but um, and so he he argued that conversation differs from logic because it's situated action, and so this very much set this the stage for a lot of what came after. Um, I put it in this context the way it was, just because historically that's where it appeared. But he's he was really kind of the initial insight for everything I've been talking about in terms of my own look, way of looking at things. But we don't really use his maxims anymore. We, we go along with the idea that there is this conversational principle. We don't really even call it that anymore. We just call it uh, something more like um, the, the idea, let me see, like the idea that individuals act in accordance with their goals. So I was actually invited last year to a conference uh, in Japan by the Ministry of Informatics of Japan, uh, with, and they had the organizer had read one of my papers and, and wanted me to come and talk about language as a goal-directed sequential action, and that's really basically what it is. It's a kind of action that we do. Language is something we do, and so the interpretation of it is that we can assume that somebody is doing something. It doesn't even have to be a language. Language is just one of the many things we do in order to communicate, but. They're, because they're doing it with some goal in mind, we can try to infer their goal. So the, the maxims and the idea of violating maxims and all of that kind of very quickly became old hat, and people don't really talk about that. But the idea that we do, um, uh, do things in order to achieve goals, and the reason why we can communicate is because we have the assumption that if somebody is rational, they will do things in accordance with some goal, and we can infer what that goal is using abductive inference. It's basically, I didn't put it in here, but if you go into Grice's thing more, more clearly, he talks about a theory of causality. His cooperative principle is based on a theory of causality. And of course, as we talked about with abductive inference, abductive interest is, is finding what, why something is the way it is, what, finding out that causality. So it really all ties together. It all kind of Grice trying to bring all of this together into understanding not just communication, but he said with other actions as well. So um, you know his corporate principle. Unfortunately, though, being a philosopher, he put it in a very convoluted way that made it difficult to understand what he was talking about. His earlier work and the theory of meaning was that the speaker intended the utterance to cause some effect in the recipient of the addressee and the speaker intended that cause to happen and be achieved simply by the addressee recognizing that intention. So this is a very simple thing. So this communication only has to be somebody doing something with the intention of another person noticing it and then the other person noticing it and then you get communication. So that's really creating meaning. That's the, the, the theory of meaning. So 
all of these things are really what underlie what I'm talking about as far as uh, you know uh, the creation of meaning generally all the rest of the stuff um, you can what, you know, we, it's good to know it, and it's good to understand uh, the, the the history of this and the, and how people kind of dealt with it. A lot of people really focused on maxims, trying to come up with new maxims, and trying to agree about how many maxims are there really, and all this other nonsense. And it really missed the point. It's really just about that that basic principle that we assume people are rational. They do something with a goal in mind. We can infer what that goal is, and thereby communicate. They can communicate. So that's basically what implicature is. So before this, we had talked about um, speech acts. Um, uh, wait, uh, oh, we so we talked about different types of implicature, and I also mentioned that you know you have some that are more or less conventionalized. So you have conversational implicature, which is not really conventionalized at all. It's very contextual. Then you have some generalized con uh, conversational implicature, which are kind of less dependent on the specialized context, context, context. And then you have somewhat fully conventionalized types of things. And this goes along with just what we call a usage-based approach, where the more you use something, the more it becomes ingrained, the more it becomes conventionalized, and therefore kind of automatic in how you do it sometimes. Um, and we also talked about strong versus weak implicature, that you can sometimes be, your goal is not actually to express a strong implicature, you know, some kind of get them to create one particular strong meaning, but to have some also background kind of weaker implicatures. And sometimes your goal in using a particular ostensive act is just to get those weak implicatures. Um, and we then were talking about how other things that we had talked about, um, like speech acts, reference, coherence, and whatever, that these all of these things, rather than being explained by individual um, theories of their own, as they had been in the past before Grice, these now can all be explained using this simple principle that we, in, when somebody does something, we infer the reason for it. So when they say something, we infer what the speech act is. We, we infer why are they doing it. Uh, when, they, when they refer to some, when they use a word uh, and we want to understand what the reference is, we have to think, okay, why did they use this word in this context? What is it they're referring to? And then figure it out. So <clears throat> the, all of these things, reference, metonymy, synecdoche, speech acts, synecdoche, sorry. Uh, synecdoche is a town in New York. Um, the speech acts, um, all of the presupposition, all of these things were now seen in a different light. So uh, even though some people still talk about speech act theory, it's really everything's been kind of subsumed into this idea of it all being inference uh, or so-called, what they call, most people talk about is implicature, but it's really abductive inference, trying to just infer why did the person do what they did. The maxims were just one way of talking about it, but it turned out to be not a very useful way of talking about it. Um, now, it also showed, that one of the things that was important about it, it also showed that compositionality is not a reality in the sense that a, much of linguistics up to that point had assumed that meaning was in the sentences and in the words, and that you just had to put the words together in a certain way and they had a certain meaning. But Grice showed that that's not the case, that it's not about compositionality. So, this also leads, leads to a background of what we call the um, kind of non-confidential view or the more constructionist view, where the construction itself often has a meaning, or also this inferential view. So they kind of both of these things go together. Um, so when you are inferring something, you know, like the relationship between avocado shampoo and rug shampoo, so an avocado shampoo doesn't, it, it is, Made out of shampoo made of avocado, but a rug shampoo is made for shampooing rugs. Uh, but uh, the grammatical structure is the same, so we have to infer what the relationship is. And this is true of, of quite a lot, you know, basically all of language. We have to figure out. So yeah, I noticed in the beginning we had this example of the well where they said pragmatically, um, I used their, their writing, pragmatically interpreted particle. 
but actually everything in language is pragmatically interpreted. So <laughs> metaphor also, uh, why do we say someone is in high spirits or something? You know, so metaphor itself is just a way of us making sense of something, right? So what do we mean by making sense? Well, inferring a reason for somebody saying that, you know, so we, somebody says he's in high spirits, you know, we can infer that he's thinking of being happy as somehow up, you know, up, happy is up. And he's become part of our kind of uh, cultural way of doing things. So the metaphors can differ, but it's still the same principle. Um, so if I say something that's totally false, like he's a pig, you still have to infer, why did he say, say something that's totally false? Well, he must mean there's some kind of similarity between pig and then what kind of similarity would depend on your culture again? Uh, even what is a pig yeah, depends on your culture. Um, okay, so that's just quick and dirty what, uh, what uh, the implicature in, is, in grace is about. Um, any questions about that? Clear, good. Because it's really what I've been talking about all along. It's just said it in a different way. Grace just said it in a different way. And so we've had to kind of unpack what he said and try to make it more simple and easy to use and easy to understand. Okay, the next thing we talk, huh? Yeah. Wait, can you bring her a microphone? Thanks, I'm, I'm tethered here. Yeah. So um, on the indicator, right, we are, um, the main thing is on the abductive inference, right? Uh, the, the abductive inference, right. So that's what this whole course is about, using abductive inference to create meaning. You may have to turn it on. Push up to say talk, and then push the button. Yeah. Testing. Yeah. So, Everybody um, likes to hit microphones. It's actually not good for the microphone to hit the microphone. Just talk into it. Go ahead. Um, so my question is uh, what about like regarding the flouting of maxims? Like should we actually like look at that or like just focus on whatever? Well think saying? about you know flouting maxims. So if we if we want to think about this theory, uh, as I wrote on some of your tutorials where you use uh, the theory, you know, and you, and you kind of basically could see through the problem of using this as because thinking of it as some kind of violation as if you're violating the cooperative principle, as if you're violating the maxims. But that really isn't a very helpful way to think about it because in all cases, when somebody does something, you have to infer why they did it. So whether it doesn't matter what they said, or it doesn't matter what the other person said or what it what was. I mean, if they, they're creating a kind of false dichotomy between kind of normal and not normal, but actually it's all normal. So that's why I don't like the maxims, because the maxims create this false dichotomy of normal versus non-normal, as if the, using the maxims is not normal. But the examples like I, I showed, I mean, you guys showed me in the tutorials, and I commented on some of them, you can see how these are very normal type of things. When somebody says, can you take me to the airport? And I say, um, I have a class at 10 o'clock. That's not violating anything. That's just normal conversation. So it's kind of weird to say that that's some kind of violation of something. So, but it, it, what it is, is in, it, in all cases, when somebody says something, you have to infer why they said it. So it doesn't matter if they directly answered your question or they gave you an answer that's in a sense more informative by saying not only that they can't go, but why they can't go. So, you know, it, that's why I don't really like the maxims, but the basic principle that we, people act in accordance to their goals. And so then we can infer their intentions and do in what they, when they do something. So like when somebody says, you know, I have a class at 10 o'clock, you can infer that, okay, why did they say that? Well, it must be that they, you know, I mean, some people try to talk about this and say, well, relevance is the only relevant maxim. But even that's kind of missing it. It's a, yes, it's all based on relevance, but what does relevance mean? It means you have a way of making sense of it. So you can create a context. And we, we say, we use the word make sense. So what does that mean? We create meaning, you know, you make sense. So. You, you hear somebody say something and you create meaning, you make sense out of it by somehow relating it to 
the context to what you know about the person, what you know about things generally. And so that's how you create meaning. And that's true in all cases. So it's kind of bizarre to separate violations of the maxims and going along with the maxims and all of this other stuff. It just really pushed people in the wrong direction. They started looking at things in very weird ways. Uh, it wasn't helpful at all. So that's why we generally don't talk about the maxims, but we do understand the cooperative principle as something basic. Any other comments, questions? Okay, I forgot to mention, uh, Andrew brought up, I didn't put chapter eight on there because it's actually, there is a chapter eight, but it's only, it's actually only a page and a half, or not even a page and a half. And it's just a, a quick and dirty summary of what she talked about in each chapter without any real enlightenment involved. So I didn't bother putting it up. So don't look for it. Okay, any other questions about inference and communication? Okay. His stuff is really good, but unfortunately what happened with Grice is he didn't he didn't like publish it all at the same time. And in fact it took years. He he most of his work that was really interesting, aside from the 57 paper, was done in a series of uh, lectures at Harvard in 1968, which some people kind of mimeographed, in those days we had mimeographs, and kind of underground kind of passed them around. And then one, cha one of those lectures was published in 1975, and that kind of blew things open. And then later he published one more, and it wasn't until 1989 that he actually published the full set as, uh, as a book. Uh, so. It's, people really didn't get the full story. It's only now when you can read all of his work together that you can get the full story of how this is supposed to work. Okay, uh, next thing we talked about was uh, information structure. And we first talked about the categories of information status. So the, the pragmatic status of a referent in the mind of the uh, addressee. Uh, so if, if, an, if something is, uh, if you're talking about some actual referent in the world, or some world, um, the speaker intends for it to refer to a particular entity that exists within that particular world, then uh, we call the NP, the, the, the noun phrase that refers to it, or the referential phrase that refers to it, we call that referential. And it will be identifiable or not identifiable to the addressee. In other words, they will, as Chafe talks about, they will have a mental representation of it or they won't have a mental, re mental representation of it. So it doesn't have to be a real world referent. It just has to be that the, the person has some kind of mental representation of the referent, right? So it could be unicorns, which don't exist anywhere in the world. But when I mention a unicorn, if I've created a world in which there are unicorns, I can talk about unicorns because you have a mental representation of unicorns in my world that are created. So that can be identifiable then. Uh, so it's, it's not real world versus non real world reference. It's whether they are, have, there's some kind of mental representation in the addressee's head. This is relative to the addressee. And if it's identifiable, there's a secondary thing. So identifiable versus unidentifiable is one aspect. But there's also, it's how active is it in the conversation itself? So it may be that you know about a lot of things, but they're not all what we're talking about right now. So that's a separate category of what are we kind of talking about now. So the things that we're talking about at this very moment are what we could call active, right? So they're the most easily accessible in the sense that we've been talking about them. Then there's another category called accessible, which is not what we're immediately talking about, but is easily inferable by you either through the, we mentioned it in the text, or it's in the situation that we're in, you know, so if I talk about the monitor here, or it's inferentially derivable. So if I'm talking about something where I've um, uh, evoked a particular frame, and then I can refer to things in that frame because of that, that semantic frame being evoked. And um, I don't know if we've talked about that much, but this is a concept from uh, uh, it's actually a number of different people have talked about this, uh, both Chafe and uh, Fillmore. Chafe called them schema, uh, Fillmore called them semantic frames. But the idea is that when you mention something, um, other things related to that something also get activated to some extent. So 
like I, like I, I think the example I used was if I bought a refrigerator, I can say the door is broken because by mentioning refrigerator, the whole semantic frame of what does a refrigerator look like and what are the things that go along with a refrigerator, you know that a refrigerator usually has a door. It would be a pretty inefficient refrigerator if you didn't have a door. So yeah, I can just say the door and you can infer that I mean the door of the refrigerator. And then inactive, <laughs> there's some controversy about what inactive means. I think chafe meant things that are not really involved or in the, the speech situation at all. But Knud Lambrecht, who we're mainly basing this discussion on, um, thinks it's something that's been mentioned, but is not, it's kind of more in long-term memory. So these are kind of similar concepts, but not exactly the same. All right, so that's uh, how it, is in the mind of the addressee. And then when you are presenting it, you take that into account. Uh, you take into account whether it's referential or it's uh, not referential, if it's, it's activation state, you take that into account. And so if you're introducing one that is not, re not identifiable, you can either introduce it as a brand new unanchored referent or as an anchored referent, one where you have some kind of tag on it that helps the hearer to understand why you are talking about this person. So like a guy I work with, if I just say a guy died, then that doesn't, it's hard to make sense of it, right? So because you can't relate it to anything, we make sense of things by relating it to something that we can relate it to. Whereas if you just say a guy died, it's like, yeah, so what? You know, you can't relate it to anything. But if you say a guy I work with died, then it's like, okay, somehow it's involved with the person who's speaking. Um, and then once it's identifiable, you know, so you often will use one of these anchored things to introduce somebody and then talk about them. Once they're introduced, then they will be treated as identifiable, which means you can then use a pronoun, uh, an un unstressed pronoun or something, just not mention it at all, you know, leave it out completely if it's totally accessible and active. Now, from another point of view, we have the idea of something being specific or non-specific. So, but this is from the point of view of the speaker, not from the point of view of the hearer. So if I say, um, I'm looking for a mouse, uh, it, it could be a specific mouse, it could be any mouse. Uh, so if it's, I'm looking for a specific mouse, then it's a specific referent. If it's, I'm not looking for, if I'm looking for any mouse, some people would say that's just non-specific and maybe even not even referential at all. So, um, so this is from the point of view of the, of the speaker. Generics, um, there's some controversy about generics, whether they are really uh, referential or non-referential, because they really refer to the whole class. So they're not individualized the way identifiable reference are, but they're identifiable as a class, which makes it easy for the person to kind of have a mental representation so in a way they're identifiable. So they're kind of a, this middle ground or maybe somewhere, you know, just not relevant to that, that distinction at all. So that's why I say that it's possible to consider that with generics, the question of referentiality and, and identifiability are neutralized because they are unindividuated, but at the same time can be topical. You know, we can talk about them as a group. So we end up with this hierarchy of referential identifiable versus unidentifiable, um, and then if it's identifiable, it can be active, accessible, or inactive in terms of this kind of activation status in the conversation. And then if it's accessible, it can be accessible because of the textually means, you know, because it appeared in the actual speech act situation, you know, in terms of what we said. And situationally, it just means something in our environment uh, that's easy to identify. And inferentially means we can somehow link to it some way in a you know either a semantic frame or just somehow uh, can infer what the person is talking about. And if it's unidentifiable, then it can be introduced to the to the uh, discourse either as anchored or unanchored. And usually, an unanchored one, uh, you know, will just be a plain noun phrase or maybe have a if it's a language with. A, a definite indefinite marking will be marked with indefinites. And anchored ones are kind of interesting because sometimes they're marked with definite marking, sometimes with indefinite marking. Um, 
so I just want to uh, talk about this. The, this. What we've been talking about here is the cognitive category of identifiability and activation, which is different from the grammatical category of definiteness. A lot of people, if you read a lot of linguistics papers, they kind of mix these things up, and it's really a problem because you know they talk about definite NPs in Chinese, where Chinese has no definite marking at all, uh, things like that. So these are different concepts. You have to distinguish grammatical concepts from pragmatic concepts. Uh, I'm not going to go into that anymore. So um, that category that we're talking about, this uh, identification and uh, activation, is separate type of information from presupposition and focus. What presupposition and focus are about, you have, you're making a pragmatic assertion, in other words, you're saying something new, and the proposition which the hearer is expected to know or believe or take for granted as a result of hearing the utterance. Now this, we call it a pragmatic assertion because it's a combination of some, generally, some given, some kind of so-called old or given information or presupposition plus uh, some new information, focus. But the real, the information that is conveyed by the pragmatic assertion is the combination of the two, not the focus alone, and certainly not by the presupposition. Sometimes you have clauses where there's only focus, so then that's the whole thing. But the, uh, the, the mainly the, the point is that we don't understand any kind of so-called new information by itself. We always have to integrate it into what we know already, and that's what the pragmatic presupposition is for. The pragmatic presupposition Pragmatic presupposition, as Kamid Lambrecht talks about, he's really restricting it to what appears in the sentence generally, but he actually recognizes that it's it's basically all the knowledge we have is our pragmatic presupposition, all the things that we bring to a conversation. Um, so the pragmatic presupposition is a set of propositions, he says, evoked by an utterance, that he uses in an utterance, but it's actually by an utterance, which is, it's actually what he says is evoked by a speaker in an utterance. So it's actually the speaker who is evoking the utterance, uh, which the speaker assumes the hearer already knows or believes or is ready to take for granted at the time of the speech. Uh, whereas the focus or the focus of the assertion is that portion of a, a proposition whereby the assertion differs from the presupposition. So in other words, you have this kind of base and then you have something added to the base, and that something added is the focus. Uh, and the focus structure is a grammatical system used to mark the focus of the assertion by setting it off against a pragmatic presupposition. So we have ways in language to show which is which, because in our interpretation, it helps us to know what the speaker intends for us to more, pay more attention to and what the speaker is taking for granted. So the pragmatic presupposition is is aspect that the speaker thinks I know already. So he's not going to accent that. He's not going to hi highlight that in any way. Whereas the focus is the one he wants me to really pay attention to. And so that's why you don't even mention the pragmatic presupposition sometimes, even when there is one. Like if I say, if somebody asks me, what time are you going to school? And I say, five o'clock. So that's only the focus, but actually the whole, I have to, to in order for the person to make sense of five o'clock, they have to put it into the presupposition, put it together with the presupposition, he's going to school at five o'clock. That's the only way we can make sense of it. You can't just make sense of five o'clock by itself. Uh, so uh, he says there's a threefold distinction between information as conveyed by propositions, the pragmatic states of the reference of individual sentence constituents in the minds of speech act participants, and the pragmatic relations established between these reference and the propositions. So this is basically, you have your proposition, you know, what is said is the whole information. The status, the in, in, uh, identification status and the activation status of the individual uh, constituents of the clause is one thing, it's another type of information. And the relations, the focus uh, and presupposition relations established within the, the clause is another type of information. So all of these need to be talked about. So we talked about predicate focus, which is the generally most common type of uh, focus structure, where it's basically just topic and comment. And uh, in most languages, it is topic comment, uh, but there are languages also that are common topic, where they have the top, the, 
topic at the end and, and the focus at the beginning. So um, I've listed a number of examples here, but it's basically you somehow have an, an, an active referent that can be assumed as a, the topic, and then you're going to say something about the topic. So here we're talking about a car, and then what about it? Well, it broke down. So we can use the the it there if we want, because it is active in that conversation. And we're saying something about it, that it broke down. Um, and you don't have to worry about this whole breakdown here of uh, uh, how he, he does this. This can be confusing, because uh, it's the focus here is broke down, but the assertion is the broke down plus the presupposition that the speaker's car is available as a topic for comment. Um, topic, uh, this one, let's give the topics. The topic expression is a constituent, is a topic expression if the proposition expressed by the clause with which it is associated is pragmatically construed as conveying information about the reference of the constituent. So basically, it's just what the clause is about. Uh, it's, that's what a topic is, what the clause is about. So that's very simple. Uh, Topics are usually active, but I'm going to skip this stuff. And then the next type is sentence focus, where the entire utterance is within focus domain. So there's no topic. So in this one, there's generally no uh, nothing that we're talking about as a topic. There's there, It's kind of definitional that sentence focus means there's no topic. So if you find a topic, then it's not a sentence focus clause. But sometimes things that look like a topic are not a topic. So in this case, like my car broke down, you, you can think about, okay, what is this clause doing when you say my car broke down? If you're explaining an event that happened, because generally sentence-focused structures are used for introducing reference or events. So the reason why we accent car in here instead of down is because we're not saying something about the car. We're saying something about an event that happened. And what was the event? Well, my car broke down. But it's, it's not about my car. It's about presenting the event. So that's why it said to not have a topic. And in the other languages, you end up having some other kind of marking, either uh, more of a syntactic marking or uh, you know, word order or, or, or morphological marking uh, to mark it as not the topic. So in Italian, you can put it at the end. In, Jap in, in French, you can put it after the verb as well. And in Japanese, you use the ga, focus marker. Um, so this is things like once upon a time there was an old woman who lived in a shoe. My, you know, there came a writer. A duck just flew into the living room. You know, these are events that happen rather than being about some person or introducing a reference into a discourse. The last type is narrow focus, where the focus domain is is limited to a single constituent. Uh, so in this case, it may look a lot like. Uh, at least in this example I've given here, it may look a lot like sentence focus, but it's quite different because we already have within a pragmatic presupposition that something broke down, but in this case, we, we don't know. We want to correct the person who said the motorcycle broke down. He said, no, my car broke down. So it, it just happens in English that we use the same structure for this. In many languages, you will use a cleft construction. In English, you could also use a cleft construction. You could say, it was my car that broke down, which is a cleft construction. And the reason why cleft constructions exist is specifically to show narrow focus, to highlight one element that occurs after the, um, after the copula as the focus. So like in say my voiture qui est en bain, that's also a, a cleft construction in French. It is my car, which is broken. So, uh, so that's narrow focus. So it's, it can be any any element of the clause in English. At least you can you can focus on any element of the clause because English uses word order to mark grammatical relations and grammatical mood. It doesn't change the word order too much. Uh, to mark information uh, structure, it uses intonation quite a lot. Instead of using word order like other languages, they, because 
word order is being used for other purposes, basically to mark mood and grammatical relations. So then they just use the um, intonation. So like John gave the book to Mary yesterday, where Mary is the one in focus, or John gave the book to Mary yesterday, where yesterday is in focus, or John gave the book to Mary yesterday, uh, where the book is in focus, and so on and so forth. So you can do that with anything. And so those the element here in caps is the narrow focus element. But again, I remind you that being in caps, it doesn't mean that that, in, in this case, it is the only element that that noun phrase is the thing that's in focus. But in, in all focus structures, you're going to have an accent somewhere. So don't be confused that it's always going to be narrow focus when you see that. And we talked about Chinese. Uh, the Chinese is basically, you can, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this again, but you can explain uh, pretty much all uh, word order patterns in Chinese just using simple information structure uh, concepts. Then we talked about reflection of beliefs and attitudes about content. Well, first, any questions about information structure before we move on? A question about accessibility and activation. So to clarify, a reference in a single utterance can have different levels of activation for different hearers, right? Can you give me an example? How would you, how would um, you do that? So for example, if I tell an NTU student, oh, I'm taking language change this semester, yeah. an NTU student might be able to say, oh, Francesco is doing well, right? And Francesco would then be kind of accessible because we have the knowledge that right. Francesco teaches that. But if I said that to like an NUS student, then Francesco would not be accessible. Right. Well, that would be more a question of identifiability and yeah, to some extent accessibility. So if you don't have the same shared kind of information, uh, then you can't use that in talking to the person without causing confusion. So this is why you have to tailor what you say based on what you think the other person knows. So if you think the other person knows that class and that's taught by Francesco, then you can use it that way. But if not, then you have to kind of introduce it. That's why we have these special clauses for saying, well, I'm taking a course now called Santo Santo taught by Francesco. Then you can say what you want to say. You first introduce that information, so then you're on a new ground, and then you can talk about it all you want. Any other questions? Uh, someone asked me, since pragmatic assertion refers to the whole message in the utterance, would it be correct to say that pragmatic presupposition is just part of the message, i.e. the assertion? Uh, pragmatic presupposition in cases where there is pragmatic presupposition, in other words, uh, in, in terms of uh, predicate focus and, and uh, uh, narrow focus, yes, the presupposition and the focus together combine to make the assertion, make the the message that you want the person to get. In, in the case of um, sentence focus, there is assumed to not be any presupposition. So then it's really just the, the focus by itself. <clears throat> also, what does it mean to say that topics are contrastive in English where there is stress on the NPs of the clause? Um, they're not always uh, contrastive. Uh, like the example of the uh, my car broke down. Uh, so having stress is not a definite saying that it is contrastive. But if you with narrow focus, generally if it is a narrow focus type of situation, then usually narrow focus is used in contrastive situations. That's part of what it what it's all about. So you know, did your car break down? No, my bike broke down, or whatever. So you're contrasting one thing with another. Whereas the rest of the presupposition is kind of accepted. And so that one thing will then be um, accent, at least in English. And then is theme functioning like a topic in English since topic is more acceptable, uh, applicable in Chinese? Or do both theme ream and topic common mean different concepts? Um, actually, yes. I, my whole Part of my lecture, which I don't know, maybe we'll go through in a minute, was on the difference between theme ream and topic comment. 
that I'm arguing there are different functional structures. But in languages like English and Chinese, it so happens that the topic and the theme generally coincide. In fact, in Chinese, I have in one of my papers, I argue that the determination of topic is different in different languages. So in Chinese, it's being made the theme that actually makes it the topic. So if you take it out of the theme, it's no longer the topic, at least not the, the primary topic. If you put it after the verb, it's definitely not the topic. But you can have up to three topics in Chinese. Um, so anything in, in front of the verb can be a topic, but anything behind a verb cannot be a topic. So Chinese uses that word order principle quite, quite a bit. Okay, any other questions about information structure? All right, so we also talked about reflections of beliefs and attitudes about content. Um, so since we talked about the final part of the core of the clause in English being in focus, um, when you put something in final position, that kind of means it's not presupposed, right? So what they mean by reflection of belief is whether you think something is a fact or not a fact, right? So that Sandy thought it was Tuesday is obvious clear. Uh, you treating it as a topic, you're treating it as if it's a fact. Whereas it's obviously clear that Sandy thought it was Tuesday, you're putting it in the focus position, and so you're asserting it, you're not presupposing it. And so that's a big difference. You're just, you're not taking it as given, you're putting it up for negotiation by asserting it. Okay. Uh, someone called who said the girls were supposed to bring two quarts of potato salad versus someone who said the girls were supposed to bring two quarts of potato salad called, this is a matter of which you take to be the more important information because you would put the more important information at the end because in English, the, the, the end of the clause is the thing that the hearer most pays attention to. Because of, you know, we, we think of it like a wave, you know, this, what they used to call the sentence, uh, the functional sentence perspective where the beginning of the clause is the stuff you really don't have to pay much attention to, and the end of the clause is where you really have to pay attention. And so in this case, someone called who said the girls were supposed to bring two quarts of potato salad. The main message is not that somebody called, but that the girls are supposed to bring two quarts of potato salad. Whereas um, in, in B, the main message is that somebody called, and it just identified what that person had said at the same time. So there's a different focus there. Um, and you get the same kind of thing with so-called locative inversion and focus. So when you say something like, in the cage lurked some hungry looking lions and in the swimming pool lived the giant shark, it's because you've set up that you're going to talk about these animals. There were scary animals in both. So that's your kind of core information. So you put that at the end. So that means moving the lo locational phrase, you know, in the cage or in the swimming pool, you put that in front of it so that you can put this, uh, hungry looking lions or live the giant shark at the end where it's kind of most salient, most uh, likely to be paid attention to. Or in this one, in the southeast corner stood a tall green plant that really warmed the place up because you're trying to give an example of how the room had warmth and life. So you're focusing on that or putting that at the end. And in ditransitives, the final element is focal and the non-final object is more topical. So I gave Dana a book. The question would, would be, that you're answering in this case would be, what did you give Dana? So the, the, the book it, or a book is the most important information here. Whereas if the main thing is you know somebody, you gave the book, uh, you know the person gave the book to somebody, but you don't know who, then, you, then they might answer, I gave the book to a girl in my class. You could also say I gave the book to Dana. But in, in that case, it's still the same. So two Dana versus Dana, uh, the book two Dana versus Dana a book. The difference is which is more topical and which is more focal. And use of the simple present, we can make statements again because uh, you make it like a certainty by saying like the Celtics play the Bucks tomorrow. Uh, you can use the present tense there, which is kind of unusual about a future event, but it makes it sound more certain. And we talked about negative transportation that as a kind of hedging thing. So instead of saying, I think I can't come tomorrow, you say, I don't think I can come tomorrow. Uh, 
And this has now become kind of modality, almost it's, it's grammaticalized to the point of being just a kind of modality marking, a kind of hedge of saying, I'm not sure, I don't think. Um, we also talk about negative polarity items. Now this is an important thing that a lot of non-natives don't, don't get, that, that the difference between things like some and any, uh, whereas if, if you say, did you meet some nice people, there's an attitude on the part of the speaker that they're a kind of optimistic attitude that the person did meet some nice people and so wants to hear about it. Whereas in the case of B, did you need meet any nice people, there's kind of a more pessimistic attitude that uh, the chances weren't very good, but maybe, you know, uh, so. Or in the case of do you want some Coke, it, you really want to give the person some Coke, so you kind of have a positive attitude towards that giving the coke, so you say, do you want some coke? You know, and you hope they accept it. But if you say, do you want any coke? You know, uh, then you're kind of not wanting to really, oops, I just broke my thing. You're kind of not wanting to uh, to share your coke. Um, and then if you eat some bread, I'll cook hamburgers all week. So uh, in this one, uh, versus if you eat any bread, I'll cook hamburgers all week, where the use of some makes this into, uh, if you eat some bread, they want you to, they have their attitude is they want you to eat some bread. And then I'll cook hamburgers all week is a reward. Whereas if you eat any bread, I'll cook hamburgers all week. The person's attitude is I don't want you to eat any bread and, and I'll cook hamburgers all week is a threat. So it really changes the entire speech act uh, and the attitudes of the, the people involved by just by changing that one word. And we talked about how important this is also in terms of like medical interactions where doctors will get a lot more questions if they said you have some more questions rather than you have any, any more questions. And we also talked about discourse particles like, ah, you, it says here you went to the 12 University. I'm looking for your name now. Ah, here it is, Mr. Jones. So this ah, uh, reflecting kind of finding some information you've been looking for or something like that or something that surprises you. Or, oh, uh, oh, oh, you know, when you say, oh, uh, when you're giving suggestions, you can say, oh, we can go skating, or we can go boating, or, oh, around 2 o'clock, so you're just making a suggestion. And well marking the information as sometimes negative, but also less than the speaker is willing to say. You know, it's kind of all that they know, but less than what they, they can say. So did you get good grades in school? You know, if you say, well, right away the person knows, no, you didn't, right? So, but then you can kind of massage that a little bit by saying, I finished in the top 20% of the class. So it's like, I didn't really do well, but within the school there, I was in the top 20% of the class. Um, or did the boss say we could all go home? Well, he said those who had finished their work could go home. So in this case, it's just the boss didn't say exactly we could all go home. He said, okay, there's a condition on it. And so you're clarifying that condition. So the well there is like not fully agreeing with what A said in that case. Then you have why, why, who is the president of the United States? Why? Joe Biden, yay, yay. I sent my friends a video of dancing, that's it. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, so why uh, Joe Biden, of course. Um, Notice I would never put Trump in here. <laughs> uh, why can also have, have a sense similar to ah uh, in terms of ex, ex, kind of ex discovering something, but implies the following information is news to the speaker, but not necessarily to the hearer. Like why you're the new student, so it means I'm surprised, but you're not. And then the use of passive also reflects uh, your attitude or your kind of strategy in speaking that you either you don't know who did it or you don't want to say who did it or it's not important to say who did it. Uh, so you can use the passive or you just want to make the the undergoer the, the, the object of the uh, topic and so you put it in the initial position in a passive phrase. Okay, any questions about information structure or the other things we just talked about? Uh,
Give me a second. Staying on it right here, no thing broke. Anybody? Nothing? It's all crystal clear. Okay, um, so we did in a different order, but I'm going to just go with the order that was in my handout uh, the conversational interaction. We talked about politeness, which refers to whatever means are employed to display consideration for one's addressee's feelings. Um, so it's basically just showing regard for the other person, how they are going to, re to feel when you say or do something. So you're trying to avoid making them feel uncomfortable and sometimes trying to make them feel good. Right? And so Robin Lakoff had this uh, three-way distinction between kind of formal politeness, which means don't impose. Uh, you treat things uh, impersonally, objectively, and uh, more likely this is going to be used when you don't know the people or you are talking, you know, as a, a, a junior person talking to a senior person. And also, depending on the culture, you might avoid personal topics uh, and you might use more uh, euphemisms and titles, things like that. Then the second type is to offer options, which is a more informal politeness, where you kind of speak in a very indirect way. Uh, which again is a little bit like not imposing uh, by, but you're kind of what um, Levinson and Brown talked about is going off record to some extent. You know, by saying it's awfully cold in here, you're not really telling them to do anything. They can ignore you completely and just say, yeah, it is. Uh, um, and so in this case, you're offering options, just means that they, you have, they have an out basically. And the third one is the, inf is the friendly or intimate politeness where you can speak very directly um, then with, with type two or even type one and you can show interest and trust in the addressee. And this is, relates to the type of uh, positive face type things that, that Brown and Levinson talked about. And so uh, these all three were kind of taken into account when Brown and Levinson came up with their idea of negative and positive face. Uh, and so negative face is supposedly the, the want of every competent adult member that his or her actions be unimpeded by others. And positive face is the want of every member of his, uh, that, that his or her wants be desirable to at least some other people. And then you have threats to both negative face and positive face and different types of interactions will damage one type of face or the other. And then you have certain uh, mitigating strategies. So if you have a threat to uh, to a, here is negative face, you know, getting the person to do something they don't want to do, or saying some uh, um, somehow infer interfering with their freedom to do as they please. So giving them an order, or request, even asking a question sometimes, threatening them, of course, warnings. Um, so uh, anything that kind of means the person can't be totally free to do whatever they want to do is, in a sense, a, a, an attack on their negative face, a threat. Um, and then also, if you put pressure on them to accept an offer or a promise can be an imposition. Uh, so anything that's an imposition is, is a threat to negative face. And of course, taking anything they have uh, is going to be a threat to it. Whereas for positive face, um, because positive face is about feeling good about yourself, basically, um, it's not about being free. It's, it's you want people to like you, you want people to like what you like and be like you and all that. And so these are acts that express negative opinions of the hearer. So criticism, ridicule, complaints, you know, any kind of disagreement uh, can be a threat to the hearer's positive face. And um, if Anything you do that shows you don't care about the other person's positive face, like expressing violent emotions in front of the person, or bringing bad news about the person, or good news about the speaker, mentioning taboo subjects when the person would feel uncomfortable doing that. Um, so you, when you want to do one of these things, you have to think about the balance of three wants. Uh, 
you want to communicate the content of the FTA, do you really want to ask the person to do this, or do you really want to say this to the person, or whatever it is? And or do and also do you do there's the want to be efficient or urgent? So do you need to do it right away in, in the fastest way possible? And you do you want to maintain the hero's face to any degree? So if you're being polite, then you do want to maintain the hero's face in some way. So then you will try to do something to minimize the threat if you go ahead to do it. So you use these different strategies. You can use off the record, which uh, you use implicature, which is kind of this avoidance strategy that we just talked about. Or you can go on record very straightforwardly, uh, you know, like saying just sit down or promise to come tomorrow where you're um, expressing your thing very uh, unambiguously, which can be used uh, in the, the third type uh, that Lakoff talked about. Or more commonly, we go on record with redressive action. So the act is done, but with some redressive action that gives face to the addressee to counteract the potential damage of the FTA. So you can either address the positive politeness or the net positive face, or well, you use positive politeness, which means you're addressing the positive face or the negative uh, politeness, which means addressing the, the negative face. So you with positive politeness, you try to show that the speaker wants what the hero wants. You know, in other words, you're trying to build them up in some way and make them feel good about themselves. They are the same in some way, or that the speaker likes the hero in order to have the uh, the face threatening act not reduce the hero's positive face. In negative politeness, it's avoidance based. So you try to show that they are. You're respecting the hero's claims of territory and self-determination. You're respecting the negative face wants and will not or will minimally interfere with the freedom of action. So negative politeness often involves self-effacement, formality and restraint, uh, apologies, deference, hedges on elocutionary force, impersonalization mechanisms, and the softening mechanisms to give H an out uh, face-saving uh, line of escape so that he doesn't have to feel coerced. So we have all of these type of things, and somehow the lines disappeared, but there's supposed to be lines in there. I don't know why they disappeared, but anyway. So you, if you're going to do the FTA, you can either go on record or off record, and you can do it without redressive action or with redressive action. And if you do redressive action, it could be either positive politeness or negative politeness. OK, any questions about politeness? I don't know if I can repair this. Tie it to here. Let's see if that helps. Okay. Any no questions? Everything's crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next thing we talked about was taking what Green calls taking turns, which is basically I was talking about ethnomethodology, conversation analysis, and interactional linguistics. So this is a basically looking at the interaction between people in uh, conversation and trying to find the structure of the conversation itself. This was the original motivation, they're looking at the structures of the conversation itself, not the individual sentences or whatever, but the structure of the conversation itself, like the telephone conversation, hello, hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Okay, um, so you know that kind of back and forth um, interaction. And, but then the, the interactional linguist came along and started looking at much more detail into the actual linguistic forms used in these things. Um, so we found that much of what we talk about in conversation is very much kind of like a script, or, or at least it's, it's conventionalized to we do, you know, we have routines basically that we follow when we're in certain situations, and like a telephone call or going to a copy DM or something like that. You have certain routines that you follow. And this makes our lives smooth in a way. You know, we know what to do. We don't have to think in each case, okay, what do I do now? Okay, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do? We already have a kind of fixed routine. We can just pull that out and use it. So these things make our life a little bit easier, but it also can lead to uh, problems and sometimes, but it's, it's also just an interesting phenomenon. But it shows the conversation is inherently contextual and it's construed through social interaction. Uh, and 
they talk about, these are people that talk most about the emergence of language, that language um, comes out of these interactions. So the language structures that we think of as grammar, it's very much unlike the structuralist view. The structuralist view is that we have this fixed system of language that everyone in, in the whole language community has the same fixed structure in their minds. And this is totally not the case. It emerges in our interactions, and so it's constantly changing. There is no fixed structure. There is no structure really at all, one, no totality structure. Uh, even some of the early, you know, brilliant structuralists came to realize later on that there is no such thing as a, you know, this fixed structure uh, at any point. It's always uh, emerging out of the interactions. Um, and so this is what they call a complex phenomenon. And so grammatical structure is always temporary and ephemeral. Uh, and so they, they structure, they, they study how these, these constructions, it's basically where memory works in, in, the, in terms of constructions. We have like bits and pieces of things uh, that we remember from our experiences, uh, whether we've heard it or used it ourselves. And so we remember those things. And then when we, we're in a situation where we think we can use them, we use them. And they change, though, each time we do it. So the categories don't actually exist in advance of the communicative setting. Instead, they're constantly being elaborated in and by communication itself. They're unfinished and indeterminate. It's in this sense that the term emergent is used. The emergent grammar focuses on the boundaries of categories rather than their prototypes, exploring the leading edges of the territory around them as they move. So that what they're looking at is not the things that don't change, but the aspects that do change. Which, which is quite a lot, actually. Um, there's no end to this. And I talked a lot about projection, that a key thing that uh, was highlighted by the people working in uh, ethnomethodology, conversation analysis, interaction linguistics, is projection, uh, where we don't sit and wait for somebody to finish speaking before we start guessing when, what they're going to say when they're going to stop speaking, when it's our turn to speak, and all these other interactional aspects of the conversation. And in fact, as uh, Paul Haber says, it's projection that actually makes the whole uh, conversation interactive. It's the ability to kind of guess where somebody's going uh, in, with, their, with what they say. And you can either you know, agree with them or cut them off if you think they're going the wrong way, or uh, add to what they're doing, or you can uh, wait for your turn, and you can uh, and you can guess when it's your turn to talk. And this is because perception of the speech act is linear, and our, our interpretation is linear. So that we start in, interpreting as we hear, and so we create the first context of interpretation based on. Uh, I'll say the first thing that's said, but actually, even when you first see the person, and they're about to speak, you're already projecting that this person's about to speak. So if you watch in your interaction, you know when someone's about to speak because there's a certain body movement or they move their mouth or they take an in-breath and then you, you're expecting them to start speaking. Or maybe they'll look a certain way. You know. um, so even before the person speaking, you're already starting to do some kind of projection of what's going to happen. And then we, But once they start talking, then you, you take that as your kind of basis for your uh, context of interpretation, and it influences everything that comes after it. So it's a kind of prediction, and that's what it's called in psychology. So as I mentioned, uh, Hopper says, project, projection is what makes verbal communication an open and collaborative affair, because you can do all of these things, harmonize with the speaker's goals, interrupt it with your own contribution, offer supportive tokens, or predict when your turn will come. And that typologically different languages allow for different types of rejection. And so, and they will also uh, characteristically put different things in the theme and do different things with the theme position. So, as I mentioned, uh, with, I give examples from English that the initial segment influences the creation of the context of interpretation in terms of constraining the interpretation of the mood of the clause, the grammatical mood. And so the person can project from that. And also, what's in the mood. What's in the, the theme position helps them to understand what, not from that grammatical mode, also if it's an, an indicative clause, that what the topic is, if it's a question word question, what kind of question, what kind of information is being asked for. Now other languages will do it quite differently, but 
many languages do something with the theme, uh, more or less. So I, I gave more detailed examples, which I'm going to skip. Tagalog does it differently, although they do use theme, but they have a common topic structure. And then we talk about functions of questions in conversation. Uh, a single form can be put in a lot of different uses, um, like what, you know, a sincere question, a rhetorical question, a clarification, confirmatory, solidarity question, or a command. You can use questions, you know, the same construction, basically, for all these different things. Any questions about the interactive aspects? Okay, the last thing we talked about was humor, uh, which is an interesting phenomenon pragmatically because normally when we're interacting with people, we try to make it as easy as possible for them to understand us. But with uh, both literature and humor, we try to actually make it more difficult for the person to, in other words, have them do more inferential work to figure out what we're trying to get at and maybe even leave some ambiguity uh, and they like that. Uh, so people like to read literature and they like to listen to humor because we're making them do more work. Uh, and that's kind of a weird anomaly, but uh, it's not really an anomaly. It's just that because it's a, uh, you know, creating meaning is a survival technique like the other survival techniques uh, that we have or, or survival instincts that we have, uh, we like to do them. You know, we like to eat, we like to procreate, we like to uh, do inferences. And doing inferences is actually one of these things. Uh, so we can do this by, by association, these two different semantic frames at the same time, uh, and seeing some kind of matching between them. Uh, you can relexicalize something using a pun or whatever, which is kind of the same basic idea, but you're so-called flipping it. Um, uh, you can draw on inferences in some particular way. Uh, all words are, are phrases are vague or ambiguous, but that's not enough to create humor. What it needs is for some kind of opposition in the meanings or a change in the interpretation of the form. And you can be deliberately deceptive to set up expectations and then go against them. Uh, so what I talked about is garden cat utterances, where you, you, you make them think you're going one way, and then you suddenly change and have them kind of rethink the whole clause and come up with a totally different meaning, and then they laugh at that. They think that's funny. The worst part, though, about analyzing humor is by analyzing it, you kill it. It's, it's terrible to analyze humor. Humor is not meant to be analyzed. It's meant to be just enjoyed. But once you start you know, looking at it, and you take it apart, and you say, OK, this, this, and this, and then it's like, that's not funny anymore. You know? And of course, it's very cultural, too. So. Um, if you don't have the background, it goes back to what Andrew was just saying, if you don't have the background to understand some of the references and humor or get the, very often they involve attitudes. So like, I, I don't have it here, but I, I, I had it when I was teaching in Australia, I could use a cartoon where, in, in Australia, Australia is a weird place. And in, in, I mean, every place is weird, I guess, have their own weirdnesses. In Australia, sports is the main religion, right? So when you open a newspaper, it's not about world news, it's not about anything, it's about sports news. That's the front page news. And there's, there's sports people are always getting in trouble because they're you know young, strong guys who like to mess around all the time. And so they're always getting in trouble. So their news is always the, the top news of the day. And so one day there was these two guys who did something wrong. And so there was a tribunal, there's always tribunals uh, to do something with these guys. And, penalize them in some way. So they have this sports tribunal. So they had a tribunal, and these two guys who had done something wrong, I don't remember what it was exactly, um, supposedly got off free, and they got transferred, though, to Adelaide. So then people were saying, oh, these guys weren't punished. But then there was a cartoon that said, we did punish them. We sent them to Adelaide. But you have to know the Australian context to know that like Adelaide is considered the armpit of Australia. You know, It's just it's not a good place. And so it rains all the time. It's got crappy weather. Uh, and it's, so uh, in, in that context, that would be very funny because everybody kind of has this negative impression of Adelaide. And so they can put that in the comic. And so you have to have these shared uh, kind of 
attitudes, I guess, in some cases. Uh, priming is involved here. Uh, you're reading kind of uh, uh, like, like this, have you taken a bath? Why is there one missing? So you're kind of, again, being led to think in one way, but then you have to go back and think about it in a different way. Um, and being moved from one frame to another, supposedly, is, according to Freud also, is uh, something good. And then there's sometimes lexical cascading, where you put uh, words from the same semantic frame. So this is you know, one, one use of the semantic frame, is by putting them all together when you're talking about something like the food features large on summit menu. Uh, and also extending metaphors, uh, coming to non-valid conclusions, like uh, the one about ice being really dangerous. Uh, so, uh, or mentioning something that everyone has thought about or had a similar experience. Uh, and then I gave you some references. Okay. Is, are there any questions about humor? Any questions about anything? Same, exactly the same. Um, I like that format because it's quick to mark. Uh, seriously. Especially in the past, when I, this semester I'm only teaching one course, but in the past when I had to teach more, and I do this weekly assignments with every class, so one semester I had 1,580 things to mark. Without making friends with a bottle of tequila, I never would have got through that. But uh, it, after that, I said, I'm not doing this anymore unless I can make it easy. So I, now I try to make it as easy as possible so I don't kill myself and don't have to run to the bottom. I can't drink it anymore, actually. OK, no questions. Everybody's already packing up and ready to go. Yeah, we got one question in the back. How much do you have to focus on the earlier chapters? How much do you what? Have to focus on the earlier chapters, the one that were tested. Nothing. It's all about the later chapters, except there's one question about the overall course, but uh, somewhat similar to the, the question on the first part. But other than that, the, in terms of all of the other chapters, the, the first part, is, this is just from the ones I covered here. OK, good. So see you tomorrow.